Buddha never taught bare attention. He taught appropriate attention. This is important to bear in mind, B-E-A-R in mind. Because if we think that the heart of the meditation is just simply bare attention, it causes all kinds of misunderstandings. That meditation is simply a process of watching whatever comes up and not doing anything about it. Or even deeper, the idea that if all you have to do is have bare attention, why do you need the Buddha's teachings at all? Just try to be as passive as possible. You don't need to study, just practice passive awareness, and that'll take care of all your problems. Sometimes you hear people say that bare attention is, is the unconditioned, that a moment of bare attention is a moment of awakening. If you believe that, you close off the path to awakening. Because if you don't see that there's a difference between the path and the goal, you're never going to get the goal. You work on the path and then you have to let it go at some point. But if you don't do the work on the path, you never get there. And we're not trying to revert to some sort of pre-existing state that the mind was in before it started getting subjected to all these nasty conditions that make us suffer. The mind itself actually goes out and is actively looking for conditions. It creates conditions. It's not an innocent victim. And it's this understanding that helps get you on the path to appropriate attention. You see that everything that you experience has an element of intentional input right here and now. Part of what you experience comes from the past, and part of it has to do with what you're doing right now. And you have to see that sometimes what you do is skillful and sometimes it's not. That's the basic framework for appropriate attention. It's the framework that gives, gave rise to the Buddhist teaching and the Four Noble Truths. There are skillful mind states and unskillful mind states, states that make you suffer are the unskillful ones, states that lead you away from suffering are the skillful ones. You've got to look for those. And how do you recognize them? You look at them in terms of what they do. The Buddha once said that he, he got on the right path simply by looking at his thoughts in terms of cause and effect. In other words, instead of getting into the thought and driving off with it, he watched it. Where does it go on its own? What does it lead to? He found the thoughts that imbued with sensual desire, ill will, cruelty. These cause suffering. As for the ones that were free from those things, those were skillful thoughts. Even more skillful was the ability to get the mind to settle down and not have to think about anything much at all, just focus on one topic, get it in a good, strong concentration. So that's how we got on the path, was beginning to see things in terms of cause and effect, skillful and unskillful, and particularly focusing on his own mind. This means that to develop appropriate attention in our own practice, we've got to look at what's skillful and what's not. That's the gauge for everything in the practice. This is why the Buddha never gave one-sided instructions on meditation, either be totally passive or totally proactive. There's one point where he talks about right effort. He said there are some times when you're just letting things go along their normal rate and everything is perfectly fine. You can live at your ease and there's no problem. But if you find there are times when you live at your ease and unskillful mind states start multiplying, okay, you've got to start making more of an effort and dealing more with pain. In other words, forcing yourself to do things you may not like to do. And on top of that, there are the mind states that respond to simply watching. The Buddha doesn't call this bare awareness, he calls it equanimity. Even equanimity, he said, is a fabricated 
state of mind. You make up your mind that you're not going to react to anything, you're just going to watch. That's a very strong intention right there. And sometimes that's all you need to deal with whatever's coming up. Sometimes it's all you can do with whatever's coming up. But remember, it's just one tool in your tool chest. You also need the ability, the Buddha said, to work on things more proactively. There are times when you actually have to fabricate and think and analyze in order to get past a particular unskillful mind state. Either fabricating stronger concentration to resist it, or fabricating discernment to try to figure out ways of getting around the problem, taking it apart, seeing what makes it work, get down to the nuts and bolts. And it's interesting that in the Sutta, when the Buddha talks about this issue of being more passive or being more proactive, he doesn't give any examples and he doesn't give you any idea of which technique is going to work where. That's up to you to see for yourself. Because, of course, different techniques will work at different times for different people. And it puts you on the spot. It means you have to be responsible. You have to actually look for yourself. And when you think about it, how else would you develop discernment if you're simply trying to clone the Buddha's insights? What would you see? You'd see what you had cloned. You would see your preconceived notion of what his insights were. There's no guarantee at all that that would be insightful or especially helpful. The guarantee comes from your own looking and your own honesty and gauging the results. And this is why the path is one of heightening your powers of observation and building on your basic honesty. This is what enables you to see what works, what doesn't work, what really works, and what only seems to work. So it may seem like you're being set adrift without any clear instructions. But what the Buddha is doing is opening your mind to different possibilities. If you have a very narrow idea of what meditation is, it's not thinking, it's just being passively aware, that ties your hands and feet. So the defilements that do not respond to that have free reign in your mind. They can do anything they want to. One of the advantages of studying the text, learning what the Buddha had to say, is opening your mind to different possibilities. There can be a more proactive approach to meditation. He gives you examples of how to think your way around lust, how to think your way around anger, fear all the other things that get in the way of getting the mind to settle down and gain insight. Notice here that the insight is always something very practical. I was talking this morning with someone who was reflecting on the whole problem of connecting compassion and wisdom. And a lot of times it seems like there are two very different strains of Buddhism, there's the compassionate strain where you just have this big, tender heart. And then there's the wisdom side that tells you, well, there is no self or things have no self-nature. And the two teachings don't seem to have anything to do with each other. But if you look at the wisdom that the Buddha taught, it's not about metaphysical issues. And the compassion is not just having a big, tender heart. It means taking your compassion seriously enough that you want to understand what really works to help put an end to suffering. So you can't just go on good intentions alone, or a nice, fuzzy, warm feeling about people. You have to be responsible, see, okay, what works, what doesn't work. When is it better to be quiet? When is it better to be more proactive? And the Four Noble Truths provide the framework for that, looking to see okay, when there's suffering, what's causing the suffering, and then attacking the problem right at the cause.
when wisdom is expressed in this way, then you can see the obvious connection between wisdom and compassion. The two have to go together. After all, goodwill is what underlies the teachings in the Four Noble Truths. If there weren't the desire for happiness, why would the issue of suffering be the central issue of the teaching? Suffering and its end. Why would that be the central issue? The motivation has to be on, based on goodwill. And the wisdom here is actually training your goodwill, training your compassion, both for yourself and for other people, so that your choice of when to be proactive and when to be more passive really is conducive to happiness, really is conducive to the end of suffering. When you have this framework in mind, that's when your attention in meditation will be appropriate. You're learning to look at the right issues. You have a wider sense of what's possible, but you also have a very precise sense of where you have to focus your attention, what kind of attention you bring to the moment, what details in the present moment are salient and which ones are totally irrelevant to the issue of suffering and its end. That's how your attention becomes healing attention, compassionate attention. It's well-informed, well-motivated. It's not bare at all. So learn to inform your intention and inform your attention, both by becoming familiar with the Buddha's teachings and also by looking in your own mind and see what works. After all, where do the Buddha's teachings come from? It comes from his experience of looking into his own mind and seeing what really worked. And seeing the issue clearly enough that what worked for him was not just something that might work for a prince back in India 2,500 years ago, but it gets down to the basic structure of how human beings suffer, how they cause themselves suffering, which works not only for Asians, but also for Americans, for people of all colors and all nations at all times. So take that framework and learn how to apply it to your present experience as skillfully as you can, because it's in the effort to be skillful that you're going to develop both your compassion and your wisdom. and the type of attention that really does lead to the end of suffering.